Okay, first of all, thank you very much, Nina. And uh, well, I should thank Jonathan also, who did make it today for prior schedule, due to prior schedule uh, conflicts. But uh, I want to invite both of them for inviting me here to speak about a topic that's actually dear to me. Um, and also, it's good to see some students uh, in class. I'm glad you made it. Uh, the reason why this topic is dear to me is because it explains my own family's immigration history here to the United States. And fortunately for me, this turned out to be my dissertation topic. So obviously, this resonates at a very personal level for me, rather than you know my dissertation simply being simply being a arduous attempt at scholarship, professional scholarship, and research and so forth. Um, I was really on a quest for self-knowledge, it turned out. Um, so just a few prefatory remarks about this topic, as hinted in the title. The focus is upon Filipino nationals or Filipino citizens recruited into a foreign military, specifically the United States Navy and Coast Guard. So the question emerges, why would the United States uh, military recruit non-citizens? And in this case, it's due to a, a labor problem within its ranks. Okay, and specifically, uh, the Navy and the Coast Guard sought to replenish um, its supply of naval stewards and stewards uh, to, um, you know, to simplify their tasks is basically they were servants for naval officers. They served their food, they cleaned their quarters, they were like domestic servants. Uh, they fetched whatever they, you know, hey, get me this, steward, and they would get it, okay? Uh, so, as you can see, um, um, very much a task that resembled servitude, that pretty much is servitude, right? So, uh, this, they decided to replenish their um, uh, their supply of stewards during the age of civil rights. And previously to, previous to Filipinos, you had African Americans serving as stewards. And, you know, with them clamoring for their rights um, during the civil rights, you see, uh, you know, the Navy officialdom questioning uh, where to find this new source of domestic workers. And, you know, the answer to that was their former colony, which is the Philippines, right? The Philippines was colonized after Spanish-American War through 1946. So, because of reigning ideologies pertaining to Orientalism, or derived from Orientalism, which I'll explain in a second, and also what I call colonial technologies of power, it was presupposed that these Filipino post-colonials would be a tractable and servile, docile labor force, unlike African-Americans. And indeed, this presupposition was shattered. This is exactly uh, my dissertation topic. Okay, um, it's an oral history of these Filip retired Filipino stewards. Many of them are in San Diego. My father was a naval steward, um, and I grew up with these stories. And you know, like I said, it's a blessing that I actually uh, um, engage in serious scholarship that, um, based on what I heard growing up as a kid. You know me and my siblings. So my hope is that this work will be a, a work of reclamation. That is to say that my father's voice and thousands of like him can be rescued from their marginalization, if not invisibility altogether, from mainstream United States history. Okay, from the dustbin of history, to quote Marx. Okay. So, American Dream Deferred, Filipino Nationals in the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard, 1945 to 1970. In spite of its Atlantic orientation, the United States at the turn of the 20th century announced itself as a Pacific power. Westward movement did not seize upon reaching the western shores of the continent. Indeed, the inexorable march of expansion proceeded towards remote areas of the Pacific places unfamiliar to many Americans at the time. Central to this venture was the occupation of the Philippines, then a colony of tertiary importance to the collapsing Spanish Empire. The opportunity to seize the islands arose with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War 
as Admiral Dewey's fleet sailed with deliberate speed to replace the Spanish occupiers. Uh, the goal of making the Pacific Ocean a, quote, American lake was thus underway. Nearly five decades after Dewey sailed triumphantly into Manila Bay, the U.S. granted the Philippines formal independence in 1946. Such a grant, however, cannot be entirely interpreted as an act of benevolence. After World War II, the U.S. no longer needed to don the habiliments of a colonial empire as its vital interests in the Philippines were, protecting, were protected owing to its collusion with the native oligarchic ruling bloc. Furthermore, the American sphere of influence in the Pacific could be protected with the presence of U.S. military bases in the Philippines. Um, indeed, the Military Bases Agreement of 1947 between the United States and the Philippines, the newly uh, independent Philippines, granted that the U.S. could continue to lease its military bases at no cost for another 99 years. So the cumulative effect of these measures was the establishment of the Philippines as a, quote, neo-colony of the United States. A further provision in the military bases agreement was the continuance of the U.S. military's recruitment of Filipino nationals. After World War II, thousands of Filipinos exchanged their labor power with the U.S. military as the possibility of poverty loomed as a future reality. What drove these young men were their dreams of success in America, a place where, according to their colonial history books, the exploration of a frontier combined with industry and hard work led to material success. Yet such dreams of upward mobility and material acquisition slowly dissipated as these Filipino stewards realized the exploitative conditions and unfair regulations which precluded the possibility of moving up the military ranks. Due to their status as Filipino citizens, these enlistees were consigned to only one occupation in the Navy and Coast Guard, that, an officer's, that of an officer's steward. The steward's job could aptly be described as domestic work, preparing and serving the officer's food, cleaning their living quarters, and so on. Yet the task demanded of these Filipino recruits con extended considerably beyond this official job description. Menial tasks such as shining shoes, running errands, fetching coffee, serving the officer's friends and family, redefined the steward's position as coextensive with personal servitude, as non-citizens barred from entering other occupational ratings within the Navy, these Filipino stewards were relegated to the lowest rung of the U.S. Navy's occupational rating system. Surprisingly, only scant attention has been paid to this important migratory labor group in Filipino-American history. Yet it will be shown that the attempt to understand their experience experiences yields a richer understanding of U.S. society and culture. Indeed, their positionalities can be viewed as a prism refracting historical relations that include American militarism, neocolonialism, transnationalism, labor, and race. Methodologically, I have chosen to conduct an oral history of Filipino Navy stewards currently residing in the San Diego area. Uh, though the sample includes interviewees from considerably diverse pre-migration backgrounds, such as regional, um, educational, occupational differences, it is believed that their experience typified those of Filipino stewards recruited between 1945 and 1970. Now retired from the U.S. military, their spoken memories reveal how they confronted their constructed positionalities as marginalized servants post-colonial subjects, and foreign others. Throughout this paper, their experiences are occasionally viewed through the optics provided by various post-colonial and critical theories in the hope of unraveling the complex contexture of relations mentioned above. Most importantly, it will be, showed how, it will be shown how these Filipino stewards developed a culture of resistance amid a deterritorialized social and political space. Part one, search for Filipino, quote, table navigators. In spite of President Wil William McKinley's imperial rhetoric to uplift, educate, and civilize the Filipinos, 
The U.S. has historically viewed Filipinos more as a source of cheap labor. Filipinos, for example, represented one logical solution to the agricultural labor problems of Hawaii and California and were effectively used in breaking strikes in the plantations of Hawaii during the 1920s and 1930s. Similar use value of Filipino labor power was applied during the 1950s when African Americans in the U.S. Navy, previously relegated to the lowest occupational rating, began to demand equal work conditions. Once again, the U.S. would look to the Philippines for a solution to their labor problems. By the 1950s, the U.S. Navy increased the recruitment of Filipino sailors to 2,000 per calendar year. Upon interviewing these Filipino stewards, I, I found that economic necessity was the primary factor in their decision to join the U.S. Navy. Yet not all Filipino applicants were unemployed or uneducated. In actual truth, many would-be stewards were college educated, holding degrees such as engineering, business, and commerce. Moreover, a considerable number were employed, though they typically held low-paying jobs that offered no promise in a sagging Philippine economy. Before his recruitment in July 1955, Tony Javier worked as a butcher while collecting, or excuse me, while attending college in Far Eastern University. Though pursuing a degree in business, he was acutely aware of the grim economic prospects awaiting the typical college graduate. Tony remembers how good fortune played a role in his recruitment. Quote, I was working in the Navy commissary store and I was lucky that I knew somebody and they recommended me. It was hard to get in with all this unemployment in the Philippines. A lot of these young men, even if they finish college, they don't have jobs at all. Uh, that's, there's a lot of them with college degrees in the Coast Guard at that time. Unquote. Sergio Nurumbaba faced similar circumstances before his recruitment. Though ne nearly finished with his studies in commerce, he was lured into joining the U.S. Navy when the opportunity presented itself. Recruited in May 1960, Sergio judged that a stint in the Navy offered more economic promise than a business career in the Philippines. As he recalls, everybody wants to get in. That was your chance to be able to upgrade your life. I was almost graduating from college in the Philippines, and I know there were so many college grads at that time, yet so many of them don't have jobs. The positive impression of America as the land of opportunity held almost equal sway in their decision to enlist in the U.S. military. Indeed, many young Filipinos cited their own adventurism, a willingness to explore the uncharted territory of the U.S., and to stake their claim, so to speak, as a factor influencing their decision. Moving east across the Pacific was a path towards a fabled land of overabundant wealth. Bert Amano is one interviewee who held such a view. A self-described adventurous, Bert worked as a golf academy, a caddy, caddy, excuse me, for U.S. Naval officers before his recruitment at age 22. He tersely sums up the commonly held belief about Americans, quote, everybody who lived there in America was rich, unquote. Paul Maestre, working as a busboy before his recruitment in 1959, recalls being questioned by his American naval interviewer, quote, why do you want to join the U.S. Navy? You are Filipino. You should join the Philippine Navy. And I answered, because the salary is dollar. And they were thrilled. This guy's honest. So I think that made me qualified, unquote. The Filipinos' idealization of America is not surprising, given, given the economic dominance of U.S. capital at the time. Yet for many Filipinos, an awareness of structural conditions, including upward mobility in the United States, was most likely obscured by the ideological meta narratives of equality, freedom, and individualism inculcated by Western culture, Western colonial culture, to be particular. Indeed, many scholars have cited American culture itself as a colonial technology of power employed in the attempt to ideologically subjugate the native. American-style education was particularly effective in this regard. In contradistinction to Spanish colonial practice, the U.S. government developed a program of free and universal education conducted in the English language uh, 
in order to quell resistance to colonial rule and win influence the mass of the Filipino people. American educators constituted a, quote, second army of occupation, according to Filipino historian Renato Constantino, following military conquests. The intended effect of this policy was to bolster the hold of the U.S. government on the popular mind in the Philippines, to undermine the influence of Philippine nationalism, and to inculcate ideas of white superior, superiority, according to Constantino. The effectivity of this practice of epistemic violence is reflected in Pali Palagutans, who's my father, recollection of how his pre-migration belief of America was formed. Quote, I had seen a lot of American movies, plus I learned it in history class because we studied U.S. history, unquote. Pauli's remembrance of colonial space further served to accent the white colonizer's putative superiority. Quote, I was in Alangapo, a Navy town. The town of Alangapo, you could see the difference when you go inside the base. It's well streamlined, it's clean, you know. When you go outside the gate, to the town, it's back to Filipino style. There's no order. Even the smell inside the base, it's different. So this statement invokes Franz Fanon's, the famous post-colonial scholar, observation of colonial space, quote, the colonial world is divided into compartments, unquote. Indeed, we are reminded that the Manichaean demarcation of space separating colonizer and colonized is essential in re reinforcing imperial hegemony. This geography situates the clean, well-organized, well-lit space of the colonizer alongside the dirty, unorganized, ramshackle quarters of the colonized. Such a dichotomy serves as a justificatory framework in the subjugation of the putatively inferior native. Of course, the colonizer fails to recognize the fallacy in confusing cause for effect. Polly's contrast of the ordered space within the U.S. military base with that of the chaotic space of the Filipino town of Alangapo is a further reminder of American neo-colonial presence in the Philippines. Though the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard actively sought young Filipino men to serve as stewards, enlistment into the U.S. military was not easy since it was extremely competitive. Lucio Pontenars' amusing story reveals how he recruited himself into the Navy. Prior to his enlistment in 1946, Lucio was hired as an office clerk for an American doctor in Sangley Point during the end of World War II. This doctor had the uh, disagreeable responsible, responsibility of medically examining young Filipino candidates hoping to list. Evidently, exploitative work conditions began even before Lucio enlisted in the Navy. The American doctor instructed his new office clerk, Lucio, to perform the unpleasant job of bodily examinations. Quote, after a couple or three times I was assisting him, one day he let me do it alone, observing me, and then I thought I, he knew that I could handle it. And then he told me, okay, Pontanaris, you take care of the whole thing. I'm a busy man. Ironically, Lucio's victimization eased his recruitment into the U.S. Navy. In the interim between Philippine independence and the military basis of agreement in 1947, the U.S. temporarily suspended their recruitment of Filipino stewards. Lucio remembers the historical background. Quote, the Filipino president didn't want Filipino boys to join the U.S. military forces anymore because he wanted to start building his Navy, his Air Force, his Marines, his Coast Guard. So the American authorities cannot say anything. So there was no more recruiting. My office will be demolished and I will be a civilian. Oh, shit, I'll have no more job. What kind of life will I have? Unquote. When Lucio was instructed to recruit his last group of Filipino sailors, he included himself and his nephew, though he did not take the rigid physical exam. Uh, Lucio rem remembers that the, while the American doctor realized what he was doing, the doctor pretended not to notice. Prior to 1950s, though enlistment was still competitive, the U.S. Navy was less strin stringent in their educational qualifications. There is, during this time, African Americans predominantly filled the rank of stewards in the Navy. Therefore, the Navy and the Coast Guard viewed Philippines, Filipinos as merely supplementary to black stewards. Strict educational requires, requirements were not yet enforced. Uh, Lucio, enlisted in 1946, comments, 
quote, at my level, there were a lot of Filipino boys who did not write at all. They were just physically fit and know how to wash dishes, know how to shine shoes of the officers, make their bed, walk the dog, wash the socks, wash the garments of the family of the officer, unquote. <coughs> Yet as African-American stewards began to demand their right to change their occupational rating during the civil rights movement, the U.S. Navy saw their former colonial subjects as a remedy for this labor problem. The fact that educated Filipino stewards performed exceptionally well on the job prompted the U.S. Navy to implement more stringent written examinations during the 1950s. The completion of both physical and written exams was an anxious moment for these stewards since many were uncertain they would pass. In fact, a sizable number of Filipino men must have known beforehand that they failed to meet certain physical requirements. The weight requirement, for example, was 115 pounds and the height requirement was 5 feet 4 inches. Yet a number of these Filipinos were rather diminutive young men. Julian Ortiz was an unemployed 19-year-old in 1959. Desperately seeking employment, he wrote the following letter to a recruiting office in Sangley Point, thinking it was a long shot. His letter, Dear Sir, I would like to join the U.S. Navy. Thank you, sir. He was surprised and ecstatic upon receiving his calling card several weeks later. Julian has vivid memories of his anxiety once he was called to take his physical exam, as he humorously recalls, quote, You know how Filipinos are so small? And I was skinny at the time. My sister-in-law said, Julian, before you take your physical exam, you got to start eating bananas. I was riding on the bus to the recruiting office. Man, my stomach was hurting from eating bananas. When they were measuring my height, I couldn't stand up steadily. I was pushing some weight on the scale. When they were measuring my height, uh, Man, I was trying to stretch. I was trying to pass. The Western medical gaze thoroughly inspected the native body, ears, eyes, throats, x-rays, dental exams, blood tests, body cavities, the search for symptoms of exotic disease. Decades after Asians were detained on Angel Islands for weeks, unlike their European counterparts on Ellis Island, due to the fear of yellow peril, so to speak, one cannot help but notice the striking parallels. Indeed, the inspection of foreign bodies was nothing new in the transportation of labor across vast oceans to America, stretching back to Atlantic trade during the 17th century. The mental exam consists of basic arithmetic, basic science, U.S. history, and government, and of course English. Candidates were sometimes asked to engage in English conversation, conversation with their English interviewers or take dictation in order to test their English writing skills and spelling. As one can see, U.S. Navy recruiters chose to recruit those natives whom they believe doodly internalized colonial technologies of power. Part two, moving east across the Pacific. Quote, you guys are lucky. You guys made it. These words, ones that Polly Palagutin longed to hear since submitting his application three years earlier, marked a new start in the life of this young recruit. Once passing the battery of written and physical exams, these young Filipinos were sworn into the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard. The assertion of luck was surely believed by these young men, judged by the amount of applicants vying for the job. According to Timothy Ingram of the Washington Monthly, as many as 100,000 applications were received annually by the recruiting center in Sangley Point. Out of these, between 1,000 and 2,000 applicants were recruited depending on need. Sergio Norumbaba remembers that out of 300 hopeful candidates in his group, only, <laughs> only 30 passed the exam. So given the implacable odds faced by a typical applicant, it is not surprising that Filipinos successfully, successfully recruited into the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard were bestowed an elite status in Philippine society. U.S. Navy stewards from earlier generations received, were received in homecomings as members of a privileged class. As Bert Amano explains, quote, being in the Navy was a big deal at the time. Everybody says, oh man, that kid will be rich. Before their journey across the Pacific was to begin, however, the recruits had to sign their steward contracts. Most Filipinos did not know what the word steward meant or what the job entailed. Indeed, most did not initially care what they would be doing in the Navy or Coast Guard. 
as Tony Javier rec recollects. I was just very glad to sign in and come in to service because I heard about the U.S. and how prosperous they are and all that stuff. I just signed. I really didn't care what is a steward. There's no stipulations like, oh, you have to make beds or whatever, unquote. Polly Palagutin signed his contract with no hesitation. Quote, they just tell you how many years you're going to stay in the service, four or six years. Then we signed the paper that we're going to be stewards. But the thing is, we didn't know what stewards were. I don't care what it is. Heck, I'll sign the thing. Just let me in. Whatever it is, I'll learn it when I get there. Julian Ortiz echoed similar sentiments. Quote, all I know, I get in for six years. All I know is I'm going to the Coast Guard. I know nothing about a steward. I know nothing about being seasick. I know nothing about pulling a trigger on an M1. Unquote. Evidently, the U.S. Navy did not feel it necessary to explain the steward's work description, and presumably most of the new recruits did not care. Thus, a predecessor of an overseas contract labor force, which is a reality of modern-day Philippine economy, polity, and society, was formed under neocolonial auspices without a formal explanation of the nature of work overseas. What they were not told about the TN's job, a TN was a designation uh, for stewardsmen, was its menial nature. Serving officers their meals was the primary task, yet steward service extended beyond, considerably beyond that. This would be transmitted to these Filipinos as they began steward training upon completing, completing boot camp. Tony Javier would summarize what they were taught in steward training. In steward training, they teach you how to set up the table, how to set up silverware, how to clean up the room, how to do their beds. It's kind of a domesticated type of job, housekeeping or something like that. I didn't know that's part of the job. When you think about it, it feels like a women's job. And uh, I should mention that many of this is a gendered labor force of so-called bachelor society, obviously. Uh, so uh, the Navy, of course, is imbued with this masculinist ethos. Uh, as you can imagine. Um, the scholar Evelyn Nakano Glenn, in her book Issei Nisei Warbride, discusses how Japanese American women as domestic workers face problems of finding satisfaction in work, considering, considered unchallenging, as well as problems in maintaining their self esteem and independent identity in a position viewed to be, in, in, viewed to be inferior by others. In the case of these Filipino stewards, there is a gender dimension added to the problem of self esteem as these men were generally, who generally embraced a masculinist outlook were consigned to jobs considered, quote, women's work, unquote. As most stewards recall, the Blue Book, which is the training manual, contained instructions on how to serve officers, specific instructions such as the configuration of the silverware, arranged in order of use were carefully described, TNs, were instructed to serve on the left and pick up on the right. They were taught to serve in order of rank, the captain of the ship was served first, the XO exec executive officers next, down to the junior officers. They were taught how to fix salads and cook, the proper way to make an officer's bed and clean the officer's quarters. The steward's uniform was glaring, glaringly dissimilar to that of other enlistees, a white smock. Prima facie, such tasks do not appear exactly exploitative. The steward's job seems not unlike that of a janitor, or a waiter, or domestic workers. What was not communicated to the Filipino stewards, however, was that much more was demanded of them other than what they learned in steward training. The Blue Book did not contain instructions on how to shine shoes, how to wash their clothes, how to run their errands for their officers' wives, how to serve <coughs> the officers' families, how to attend to their kids, how to walk the dog, yet this was precisely the stewards' men men's unofficial job description. TNs jokingly referred to their self-referential designation, TN, as table navigators. Uh, yet Filipino recruits soon realized that their duties extended beyond the mess hall and the officer's wardroom. The knowledge already possessed by African-American TNs, that steward and servant are coterminous articulations, came to be realized by those who were brought to take their place. Part three, pathos of a transnational subaltern. Sergio Norumbaba, who enlisted in 1960, remembers that upon arrival in California, 
Fresh recruits undertook a new series of examinations during a period known as indoctrination. All new recruits, regardless of ethnicity or national origin, were required to take what's called the GCT, the General Classification Test. This exam evidently determined an enlisted person's rating, one's occupational category, that is, in the Navy or Coast Guard once they were recruited. Uh, so you have specialty ratings that include radio men, medical corpsmen, electrician, machinist mate, and among others. Due to its menial nature, the stewardsman position occupied the lowest position in this hierarchical rating system. While others were promptly rated according to the performance on the general classification test, Filipino recruits were clearly excluded from other ratings aside from stewardsmen, regardless of aptitude displayed or reflected in these examinations. As Sergio Normbaba remembers, this, well, this was to be his first glimpse of discriminatory conditions Filipinos faced in the Navy. Quote, I didn't see anybody from our group that were able to go to different rating than steward. To me, the GCT was a bogus classification. If it was supposed to be a classification, you can hold other jobs besides serving. But they didn't do it because all of us just went into serving, into the galley. The official rationale for this blatant discriminatory practice was that Filipino stewards were not U.S. citizens and thus were denied the possibility of movement within the Navy's, Navy's rating system. It was reasoned that classified information was part and parcel of other occupations, the corollary being that Filipino nationals were denied movement due to, quote, security reasons. Polly Palagutan reflection Palagun's reflection on this matter indicates that many Filipinos did in fact realize their dual positions not only as replacement workers in the Navy's labor, Navy's labor uh, problems, but also as a foreign labor pool denied the opportunity of occupational upgrade. Quote, we picked up on the notion that since African Americans cannot be stewards anymore, then we are the next victims. And the technical thing of this was we were not American citizens, so it was hard to wiggle out of this state of non-advancement. Even if you know you qualify, the first question is, are you an American citizen? You say, no. If I wanted to be a storekeeper or a yeoman, well, the response was, well, you cannot handle classified information. You are not an American citizen. Now, doubtless, most Filipino recruits did not initially mind the work of a steward, Interviewees remarked that they, were, that they initially responded to their new responsibilities with, uh, with alacrity, for it was not only their means to escape poverty of the Philippines, but also their chance to realize their dreams of prosperity in America. Moving east across the Pacific still loomed as an ineradicable memory. As Sergio Nurumbaba remembers about his first experiences in America, it was great. Our eyes were wide open. I thought, my God, this is so fun, unquote. Such moments of elation began to slowly vanish, however, as Filipinos realized their positionalities within a new space, once that, one that functioned to assign them to locations of marginality. Due to the Navy, Navy's racial, excuse me, rationalized discrimination of Filipino nationals, other ethnic groups, especially Caucasians, readily associated them with positions of inferiority, recalls Bert Amano. Quote, my first encounter that I was a minority class of people was my first time in the galley, in the mess hall. You could feel it, that they were much superior class of people, the whites. I guess it's because they know we were native Filipino and all the manual labor was performed by Filipinos. So I guess that was their impression, that we were not educated and all that. But most of us were college ed students, college educated. We were aware what was going on in current events, very versed in political issues, not only in our country, but all over the world. We were told to pick up our food as fast as we can, and then they, heard they were hurting us like a group of prisoners." Unquote. Thus, Filipinos' identities were formed anew within this deterritorialized space where existence was confounded with essence, where cause was confused for consequence. Though these Filipinos left behind the spatio-temporal boundaries of their nation state, they were unable to escape beyond the trappings of neo-colonial space. Readily apparent to these Filipino servicemen was the conspicuous absence 
of a single Caucasian steward. Quote, when we got in, the blacks were already the high-ranking stewards, and the newcomers, the Filipinos, were the lowest, recalls Polly Palagutin. Sergio Norumbaba has a similar recollection. Right on my first duty on the U.S. Van Voorhees, that's when I noticed that all Filipino and blacks were the ones in the wardroom, unquote. As the novelty of life away from the Philippines began to dissolve, Filipino stewards eventually began to despise the drab predictability of their menial work expectations. Enduring the indignities of servitude was perhaps tolerable if the possibility of promotion existed. Yet, in the case of these Filipinos, though they may, may be promoted in rank, they were denied promotion in rate or their job. Um, for many interviewees, these times were frontal assaults upon their dignity. Lucio Pontanares recalls the interpolation most hated by Filipinos Navy men. Quote, hey stewards, what, are we dogs? Hey stewards, give me a glass of orange juice. And because of our lack of status, we had to obey. Unselfish obedience, you've got to know. They're superior to us, we've got to follow. Unquote. Julian Ortiz also describes the necessary response of servile deference. Quote, you got to fix their bunks, you got to go clean their toilets, you got to clean their space, and from time to time they might call you and say, hey Stu, bring me a cup of coffee over here. And you say, yes sir, here's your coffee. Disenchantment transmuted into resentment, especially as Filipinos became aware of the possibility of advancement. Julian Ortiz's Ortiz recollection distills the frustration they felt. Quote, my first two years of being a steward, I didn't mind doing the job until I was convinced that I could do other jobs. That's when my job as a steward was getting sour. But I couldn't do anything about it at the time because I wasn't a U.S. citizen, unquote. Meanwhile, other enlisted men were unimpeded in their movement up the military ranks. Polly Palagutin's bitterness over this glaring inequity was, is still palpable. Quote, you see the white boys, they come ab aboard the ship with two little stripes, and then about a year and a half later, they're already second-class petty officer. And you've been there for four years and don't make anything out of yourself, so you become disgruntled. Why should I keep shining these shoes? I don't feel like doing it anymore, unquote. Indeed, for these mostly educated, ambitious Filipino men, the humble nature of their jobs suspended the belief of America as a source of overabundant wealth, readily acquired through industry and hard work. It dispelled the myth that Filipinos in America lived a life of extravagance and comfort. It's important to note that Filipinos in the U.S. Navy occupied a elite position at home. According to scholar Yenli Espiritu, the salary of a Filipino enlist enlistee placed him among the top quarter of the country's wage er earners. The attainment of status, however, was ephemeral, as it lasted only until their ship re-embarked uh, for the America. Upon leaving the Philippines, identities had to be reconstituted within a neo-colonial space ensuring their peripheral status. A realization made by Lucio Pantanares underscores this reconfiguration of identity, an experience doubtless felt by those who realized that their expectations of upward mobility would not be met. Quote, I was frustrated. My goodness. I did not want to join the Navy to become a servant. Day in, day out, plates and plates and plates. Wash the dishes, clean the wardroom, mop the floor, shine the shoes. To myself, I said, so this is the Navy that our Filipino foreigners went through. Exactly. Unquote. As previously mentioned, a sizable number of recruits held college degrees. Thus, it was not uncommon that Filipinos were consulted by high-ranking enlisted men and even officers in matters involving accounting and writing. Sergio Norumbaba's remembrance of this is quite vivid. Quote, I had officers that are coming to me for spelling. These officers who don't know how to spell simple words in English, and I was so upset. God damn, you're an officer, and you come to me to spell the simple word? Unquote. Interestingly, Timothy Ingram, a journalist writing for the monthly, Washington Monthly, suggested that the tra tradition of stewardship made Navy vessels analogous to, quote, floating plantations. To be sure, one can take issue with Ingram's hyperbolic usage of the plantation analogy, since Filipinos were certainly not driven by the captain's whip. Nonetheless, a comparison, the comparison properly invokes the image of a re labor relation beyond the employer-employee dichotomy. 
Tony Javier's experience with serving officers, wives, and girlfriends underscore this point. By simple virtue of being designated enlisted man on weekend duty, it was further expected that he should not cease in catering to the wishes of his superiors. Quote, at night, if I have duty, I have to stay on board. The officers bring their wives or their girlfriends on board, and I have to serve them. See, they expect me to serve them because they're the officers of the day. So what I do is go ahead and give his wife or girlfriend what he or she wants. I serve them at night. That's one thing that sticks in my mind. I have to serve his girlfriend or wife. Uh, Lucio Pontanaris also similarly recollects, you got all the dirty jobs, jobs that are not appropriate for others, they let you do it. Like if you're assigned to the quarters of the admiral, well, you're proud, but, you're, but you are a servant to the whole family. They treat you like a servant, really. Hey, can you wash my socks? Hey, Ponce, go get my, the dog for me. The little boy was ordering me. The, the, the little boy, the uh, admiral. Uh, to add to these indignities, Filipino stewards were occasionally fed rations that were less expensive than that of officers. Recollections of being fed officers' leftovers were not uncommon among interviewees. Even the simple request for rice, an inexpensive staple, was sometimes denied to them. Lucio Pontanares remembers one of his first le lessons in respecting the boundaries between officer and steward. Quote, when I was new as a steward, I served officers in the wardroom. I was on the landing ship tank, the LST, and after I served them, there was steak leftovers on the platter. I got one of those steaks and I was eating it. And an officer said, hey, you are not supposed to be eating that steak. You're not an officer. What can I say? I cannot say anything, unquote. What the U.S. Navy expected from these post-colonial subjects were responses of alacrity and docility. Did not these Filipinos themselves acknowledge their own good fortune in being employed by the U.S. Navy? While this may have been their initial response, most Filipinos reached a breaking point in their toleration of discriminatory work conditions. While most realized a return to the Philippines was mired by economic uncertainty, their frustrations required alleviation. Bert Amano sums up the Filipino stewards yearning for a solution. Well, some of the officers really treat you like you are the help. You are just a kind of helper. You are nothing but a maid, a janitor, which is difficult for me to accept and admit because I think of myself as better than a darn janitor, a basic cleanup guy. I can do better with my life. I had on my mind, I've got to get away from this. Last part, uh, part four, weapons of the week. Lured by the American dream, the promise of material acquisition, social mobility, and status upgrade, most Filipinos, t even today, would not hesitate to pursue a life as immigrants in the U.S. should the opportunity present itself. A typical experiential trajectory is one of initial elation, followed by adjustment, endless toil, and sometimes disenchantment. While most immigrants may have achieved economic mobility, it almost always came at a price. The awakening of Filipino immigrants from this highly idealized dream is not only induced by underemployment, the lack of taken for granted leisure, and the fragmentation of traditional culture, it is especially spurred by the realization of their invisibility within the larger dominant culture. Whether Navy stewards, underpaid physicians and nurses, or specialized workers laboring in unskilled jobs. Many Filipino immigrants recognize that their worth has been devalued and their labor cheapened in a country that designated, designates them to the outer edges of society. Okay, I'm going to skip around here because due to time. Uh, quote, what can you do? Refuse them? You're in the military, you'll be in big trouble, unquote. Julian Ortiz's reminder underscores the futility of active resistance towards the Navy's restrictive policies towards Filipino recruits. While a few Filipinos decided upon a return to the Philippines over an occupation of servitude, most did not consider it a viable option. Similar to earlier Filipino agricultural laborers who did not rush home with the passing of the Repatriation Act of 1935, these workers understood the dire economic prospects awaiting them in the Philippines. Their sense of pride prevented them from packing their bags. For most, however, a threshold of toleration was inevitably reached. And for these Filipinos, passive acts of resistance were inevitable responses. 
necessary in the, their reconstitution of their identities as active agents. Even those Filipinos who were not college education, educated understood that knowledge was a formidable weapon in the fight against racist practices and policies. Though Julian Ortiz's education did not reach beyond the sixth grade, he nonetheless proved to be a leader, possessing the acumen, enabling himself and others to formulate strategies of resistance. Quote, I was one of those rebellious kids. I was beginning to read books about rules and regulations. I understood what they called, quote, one man's rations. They have to give equal portions. So one day I said to the young Filipinos, hey, why are they serving them steak? How come we only have chicken wings? I said, look guys, they have to feed us better. According to this book, we should have equal portions. Man, I just wanted to taste the steaks, but they were not feeding us the right food. So I was the first one on board the ship to make a complaint. And I was at first joking to the commissary officer, sir, we gotta have steaks like you guys, otherwise no steaks, no work. And he comes back at me, okay Ortiz, no work, no pay. <laughs> the officer's retort, though given in jest, was in reality the serious truth faced by Filipino stewards. Needless to say, collective strikes in the military are strictly forbidden, prohibited. The initial passivity of Filipinos, alongside their enthusiasm and occasional obsequience, is not an overstatement. Yet while sentiments of passive resignation may have lasted months, if not years, an overwhelming number of Filipino stewards eventually refused to accept their secondary status without protest. Commanding officers event eventually found themselves in giving audience to the direct complaints of Filipino stewards. Many stewards found an avenue of protest with Navy chaplains. Yet a solution to their predicament was met with the reality of their signed contracts that legally restricted them to servitude. Thus, the common response was to discard their pretense of docility, to carry out acts of insubordination to the outer limits possible. As previously mentioned in the case of Pali Palagutan, this tactic was a response deemed inevitable by him after four years of non-advancement. It began one day when he decided not to don the obligatory white smock of the steward, leading to a slippery slope of other acts of ins insubordination, disobedience, destruction of government property, uh, foot dragging, and taking an author authorized liberty. It sh this should uh, be redolent of, or similar to slave resistance through uh, non-confrontational uh, means, right? Uh, finally reprimanded, Polly expressed his frustration to uh, his commanding officer. I said, I'm sorry, Captain. I'm not really a bad man. I'm a hardworking guy. I know what I'm doing. The problem is that I cannot make anything out of myself because of my job. I've been here six years in this outfit. I didn't even make third class at all. How can I expect to look ahead and have a family if I'm going to be like this all the time? Frustrations mounted as these Filipino stewards faced not only the impossibility of changing rates, but also the occasional over-demanding and even racist officer. While it's important to emphasize that most interviewees felt they were treated decently overall by their superior officers. They were nonetheless those officers who seemed intent on treating them like, quote, insignificant human beings, to use the words of Lucio Pontanaris. This led to subtle acts of revenge, as Julian Ortiz narrates one such incident. Quote, this dude from the South, a warrant officer, he loved to call me Stu every day. And I said, sir, it's Ortiz. I got really mad about it. I told my executive officer, sir, I request that you inform that officer to call me my name instead of Stu. My name is Ortez, Ortiz, not Stu. But you know what? I was rebellious young Stu, man. I was serving soup at the sea, the ship was rocking, and I was mad at this guy. I was serving scalding soup, and purposely I poured it on his lap. I said, oh, I'm sorry. The XO knew that I was mad, and he kind of smiled. Stories abound of how these stewards were able to exact revenge, however subtle, upon officers bent on mistreating, mistreating Filipino stewards. Unsuspected, unsuspecting abusive officers did not realize that dirty socks were used to make their morning coffee, or that dirt from the steward's shoe was mixed in with their orange marmalade. 
An officer's insensitivity or occasional cruelty resulted in uniforms, hats, and sh shoes thrown out of the ship's porthole, in asbestos placed in their bedsheets, in steaks seasoned with a su steward's saliva. Of course, <laughs> of course, not all stewards participated in these acts, and some ruefully acknowledge that they may have been improper responses to their mistreatments. Uh, such incidents, never, nevertheless, serve as communal knowledge for these Filipinos as they were attempts to re-territorialize a hegemonic space that attempted ne to negate their agency. Uh, not only were they able to practice these non-confrontational -conf acts, but um, upon research, I found that they were actually able to... Uh, practice labor stoppage, uh, and I was, able, I was fortunate enough to interview some who recall this. Um, and here's one such uh, um, episode. The frustration of Filipino stewards and their mess attendants reached a crescendo at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut during 1960. Tasked to serve the cadets, many Filipinos weird and wearied and frustrate, frustrated after years of servitude to their superior officers felt the sting of indignity deepen further since they were now serving boys fresh out of high school, so to speak. Adding insult to injury was the fact that they were denied their simple request for rice to be included in their rations. The refusal to serve rice to these Filipinos was construed as unreasonable since it was an inexpensive request. A responsive chord was struck. The greater concentration of Filipinos at the academy, Tony Javier estimates that approximately 100 Filipinos worked as, worked as stewards at the time, formed a semblance of class consciousness among them. Julian Ortiz, also stationed at the Coast Guard Academy at the time, did not slacken in his role as, uh, the notorious, as a notorious, quote, Filipino headache, unquote, a designation he earned from his commanding officer due to his rebellious streak as he became a leader in fomenting revolt against their inferiorization. As he recollects, quote, one day we decided we don't want to serve as cadets. We don't want to serve the cadets. We were mad. We were tired of being a steward. So we decided, hey, let's walk out of here. It had something to do also with the food, too, because sometimes they just served us leftovers. Whatever the cheapest food to feed us, that's what we would get. Thus it happened one day in 1960s, Cadets at the Coast Guard Academy awoke to discover that there were no Filipino stewards and mess attendants to serve them breakfast. News of the display of disobedience reached the Admiral's ears. Tony Javier has a vivid recollection of how this issue was resolved. Well, the Admiral comes into base and says, what's happening, boys? And some of us say, well, Admiral, all we want is rice with our meal. That's our request. We're not used to this mashed potatoes or whatever you have for that day. All we want is rice. What else do you need, the Admiral further asked. Well, Admiral, that's all we wanted. The Admiral then said, okay, boys, you go back to work, and I promise you you're going to have your rice. But if you don't go back to work, I promise you I'm going to send you back to the Philippines. And so we have rice for lunch. And not only do we have rice, they assigned us one cook just to cook the kind of food we like. Uh, and um, I also uncovered episodes similar to that at the uh, Navy Academy uh, of, of strikes. But for lack of time, I'm going to um, pretty much skip to the end here since uh, I'm approaching my hour and just summarize or summarize uh, the talk here. Free floating signifiers. Filipino stewards migrating to America in the decades after World War II formed a unique diasporic group. To be sure, they did share broad similarities with other migratory waves of Filipino laborers. Filipinos, as former colonial subjects, are not immigrants in the traditional sense, as neither slaves, wards, nor citizens. Filipino migrants occupy the limbo of alterity and transitionality. Their indeterminate positionality served to vitiate the explanatory power of assimilationist theories of migration, which view both movement and acculturation as unidirectional and unilinear. Furthermore, scholars such as Dorothy Vegeta Roney note the transitory character of many Filipino agriculturalists whose everyday lives were marked by impermanence 
due to the seasonal nature of their jobs. Thus, the liminal experiences of Navy stewards mirror those of the pioneering Filipino agriculturalists migrating before World War II. This condition of betwixt and between, if you will, however, is made more transparent given the fact that Filipino stewards were stationed aboard Navy vessels, symbols of U.S. military power. As previously mentioned, these Filipinos, in an almost literal sense, did not escape the hegemonic structure of neo-colonial place and space. Thus, Filipino sailors on board Navy vessels give a new meaning to the term floating signifiers, free-floating signifiers, to borrow a term from the philosopher Derrida. Uh, for these young migrants, the ship was literally their place of settlement. A comment of process of Professor Pali Paligun underscores the radically transitory character of these Filipino migrants. If you're single and you don't have any relatives, the ship is your home. Yet it can't be concluded that indeterminacy characterized their lives as they were able to forge not only transnational links to their place of origin, but also a culture of resistance. The U.S. Navy served as both colonial institution and an employer of Filipino labor. As liminal migrants, they were literally unanchored to a geographically determinate place of settlement. When Filipino stewards were finally able to overcome raiding restrictions and raise families, they would eventually settle in coastal cities such as San Diego, Long Beach, and Virg Virginia Beach, places with large in, uh, Navy installation. Nonetheless, this migratory group were among the forerunners of a Filipino, quote, warm body export which describes Filipino diaspora today. Uh, Filipino warm body export, a diasporic population of overseas contract workers within this transnational circulation of labor and capital. And uh, let me just read my afterward here. By the way, I, I mentioned San Diego. If you go to South San Diego, um, below the 94 freeway, South Bay San Diego, uh, most of those gentlemen, the older gentlemen there, are retired stewards. Uh, this is what sort of socioeconomic separa separates them from Filipinos in more nor northern parts of San Diego, like Mira Mesa. Afterward, articles such as Timothy Ingram's piece in the Washington Monthly, which I skipped over, uh, exposed the plight of Filipino stewards to, to American public awareness, eventually prompting an investigation led by Senator William Proxmire into the ex exploitation of non-citizens by the U.S. Navy. Thus, an antiquated tradition, one that the Navy clung to in the age of civil rights, was finally amended in the early 1970s. And after that, Filipinos were allowed to enter other occupational ratings. Immediately upon implementing the new, Filip the new policy, Filipino nationals served in 56 out of the 87 ratings available for enlistees. So it's important to note, they were only allowed to serve in one out, out of the 87. Now they served in 56. Indeed, all of the interviews mentioned rose swiftly through the military ranks, eventually holding positions of much greater responsibility and authority. Pali Palagutin, for example, eventually rose to the rank of senior chief, becoming accustomed to giving orders rather than receiving them. Though Bert Amano's earliest task was a steward to clean this officer's wardroom, uh, decades later he would be allowed privileged ac access to the officer's living spaces, rising to the rank of warrant officer himself before his retirement. These Filipinos chose to dedicate their professional lives to the U.S. Navy's in spite of the discriminatory conditions they initially faced. Now in their retirement years in San Diego, these men reflect upon their early times of struggle with an admixture of nostalgia and humor, though vestiges of frustration and resentment occasionally cause their voices to crack and their pulses to quicken. For these men, the best form of, quote, revenge existed in the future. Their children's success in America would be proof that their struggles were worth enduring. Polly Palagutan often held this thought while he shined officer's shoes, quote, since I was a steward, my first aim, if I had a son and he's smart enough, I'm going to send him to the academy so that someone will shine his shoes because I've been shining shoes for a long time, unquote. Decades after their undig undignified positions as Navy servants, 
These Filipinos stress the virtue of education to their children as a key to life without struggle. Paul Maestre remembers being unable to hold back tears upon hearing his name of a son announced at his college graduation at, uh, at, uh, uh, at UCLA. For all he could think about was his time of struggle during his early years as a steward. Notwithstanding Tony Javier's description of the steward's task as, quote, a kind of women's job, these men were able to, re quote, recuperate their masculinity as they were finally able, enabled to move into specialty ratings. Tony ha Javier re realized that he is a better man, so to speak, since he was able to endure the indignities of the job. Lucio Pantanares reflects, quote, I have no regrets, really. I am vindicated of all these things I did. I give the Navy 22 solid years. All I wanted was not to be a great man, but to be a real man, so to say. Thank you. Yeah, as uh, to my knowledge, Bob Filner was um, was um, trying to fight for the rights of Filipino who served Filipinos who served during World War II. Yeah, and in the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the the U.S. Army that that uh, merged with the Philippine Army during that time, and you know because of that uh, one condition of of them not being citizens, you know they were denied. Um, um, you know, pensions and so forth by the U.S. government, or if, if not denied in some cases, they were receiving much less. Okay, so uh, to my knowledge, Bob Fildner and other uh, activists were trying to, you know, press their claim. Uh, and to be honest, I think that's still an issue that's going on. I don't know if it's been uh, resolved completely. But uh, Bob Fildner, uh, I, I said 1970 because that's when they lifted the rating restriction. So, um, you know, after that, you know, um, many Navy men became very successful. Many Filipino stewards became very su successful and even achieved the highest rankings possible. You know, so, um, you know, that is no longer an issue among them, you know, among the, uh, the stewards by this time, by the time the Bob Pilner was House of Representatives. So it had mostly to do with uh, World War II veterans. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't know a lot about it, but it's my understanding that uh, there was a legal battle over, um, well, kind of a linguistic legal battle um, where, where Tagalog was uh, banned or forbidden on, uh, in some context on ships. And I, I think they challenged it and the, um, the Filipino, Filipino crewmen eventually won. But I don't, re I, I don't remember the context that someone was yeah, explaining. Yeah, that's that interesting. Should, yeah, because I never heard of that ban happening during the time period that my study focuses on, which is you know nineteen forties through nineteen seventies. Yeah, it might have been a more modern like eighties, but okay. it would fit right into the body of your. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, that's something interesting that you know I, I would certainly love to research, you know, beyond the parameters of, of my you know to see what the story is behind that. Yeah. Right. Because the U.S. continued to recruit Filipinos even to this day they recruit Filipinos. Right, um, which is very interesting because you don't see other, you don't see a, you know, a, a sizable number of recruits from other countries. It's you know they really favor the Philippines, and I really think it's due to this in a structural sense pre-existing, you know, colonial real colonial <coughs> institutions that facilitate this recruitment. Right, so you can look at it in terms beyond sort of the exigencies of faced by, say, uh, U.S. Navy recruiters or the economic calculus uh, in, the, in the mind of immigrants and look at it in a structural sense as a sort of neo-colonial institution engendering this diasporic population uh, 
you know, in the form of, you know, like I said, U.S. military, which is transnational. It's not national, it's transnational. And, you know, that's what really, uh, you know, that, that's one startling thing that really uh, opened my eyes that, you know, they never got to settle like a typical immigrant. You know, you have place of origin, place of settlement. And from there, hopefully you can forge some kind of, you know, community, uh, community formation and everything. They were denied that by simple virtue of being on these Navy boats. So what you have here is a colonial society in miniature, right? Guarding this colonial empire. And you still have these guys in white smocks serving. You can easily compare a picture of these guys, Filipinos so with their white smocks serving, and look at a picture from India, right, where you see a servant, Indian servant with a fan or the guy, or the colonial administrator, and the other guy's fanning away the flies and stuff like that. I mean, that'd be good. That'd be a book cover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, when, the, when the Filipinos were uh, recruited, were, did they go through any basic training? They, they did. did. They did. Yeah. Uh, and so they and kept as, to the States first? Okay, good. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, well, you know what? My dissertation focused much more um, detailed, uh, much more details than I. This was actually a yeah. earlier talk that I gave in 2008, I think. Um, but um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, they went to basic training or boot camp, and then from there they were supposed to go to. Um, they took this test that was supposed to determine their rating, okay, but. They were denied, despite the um, results of the test, whether they demonstrated aptitude in another area like core, medical <laughs> corpsman or something, they were denied that. Mm -hmm. All Filipinos went straight to steward school, stu steward training. Um, as a, as a, I guess, a matter of formality, they all took that G GCT, the general classification test, but the results were inconsequential. It didn't matter. It was just a matter of formality for them. So that's, I think, one of the first realizations that hey, well, this is a glaring inequity that's happening here, right? Why am I being denied this uh, opportunity to serve as a commissary man? Because I clearly indicated aptitude in that. I got a better score than my Caucasian friend here, and he's going to the how come I'm not, yeah. right? So, yeah, yes? When did the Filipino service members begin to uh, get their citizenship? Uh, many of them actually attained citizenship during the Vietnam War. My father uh, did in that case because you cannot, uh, you know, participate in the war in, within a U.S. military institution or a branch unless you're American citizen, evidently. So there was this kind of a rush to, um, you know, uh, provide, provide citizenship to Filipino stewards, and my father. Uh, he got citizenship in 1968, and the very next year he was exposed to Agent Orange. So still now he's getting a lot of money for Agent Orange exposure, and he has 100% disability and all that stuff, uh, interestingly enough. But, uh, if you don't know about Agent Orange, it was this um, antifoliant that they sprayed over the jungle because the enemy could not be seen. So it was an attempt to uh, you know, take away all that foliage and expose them through these uh, these chemicals. Dioxin. What's it? It's dioxin. Dioxin? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, needless to say, this had uh, bad, uh, um, bad consequences on not only the Native population, but the U.S. Uh, Navy and Coast Guard in that area. So, yeah. Uh, do you, are you intending or do you look at uh, current Philippine labor force in the world, for example, if, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Yes. I think even recently in Africa, one of these terrorist attacks or whatever it was, there were Philippine victims. Yeah, there were Filipino workers that were killed in one of the. I did notice that. I just glanced at it. I didn't read it really. But yeah, there is such a thing as what I call the warm body labor export. How does that compare to the case of the stewards? I mean, compared yeah, was, to spread of labor. I see the stewards as sort of a uh, forerunner in a migratory sense, uh, because they are overseas, they're, con they're still contract workers, right? And like I said, they're um, in this limbo of transitionality um, and uh, indeterminacy, where they're away from their 
you know, place of origin, right? And they're, they're not, they're, they're, in, they're working within this space uh, where they're needed yet not wanted. So this sort of engenders this, you know, very indeterminate positionality in their existence, right? As, uh, I use the word free-floating signifiers, <laughs> you know, uh, in, in that sense. You know, and I think that the Filipino stewards were precursors, a historical precursor in this migratory flow. Now, today, this is a part, a vital part of the Philippine economy. 10% of the country's uh, GDP depends on uh, remittances. You know, so uh, they actually promote, the Philippine government promotes overseas labor. Okay, they call them um, heroes, national heroes. Someone maybe knows more about it than I do. Comment on that, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's called uh, Overseas Filipino Workers, OFW. Eh, OFW is the, it's, yeah. okay, there you go. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And it's number one earner of the dollars in the Philippines. Exactly, yeah. So, so the, uh, the economy of the Philippines depends on the Filipinos sending money back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much. Like I said, 10%, of it, yes. which is enormous, right, GDP? Nurse, nursing is a leader, right? Yeah, nurses. Yeah. Nursing is another thing. I mean, um, here again, you had pre-existing colonial institutions, right, um, that uh, made this migratory flow, um, you know, uh, as almost an ob well, made them the obvious choice to uh, replenish their uh, labor shortage here in the United States. At the same time, however, they're underpaid and they're, you know, exploited in a sense that, hey, maybe they need... Uh, nurses in a less desirable cities or towns, and they send them there. You know, they're paid less, and they're sent to less attractive places, such like places like that. Even the doctors are paid less. You know, and then they have to work their way until they uh, achieve parity, economic parity. With um. once they were involved in the Vietnam War, it was deemed uh, a necessity for them to become uh, citizens right away. So that was the case with my father. He had to take it. They actually had to fly him to, I forgot where. I think he said Alaska or somewhere because he was around there. And then they had to, and he had to t take the test or something because they were near there. They flew him there and then they needed him back right away because they were going to, uh, to uh, uh, Indochina. Okay, so um, a lot of Filipino stewards became citizens after that. And then they were subsequently able to move to other ratings after that. Like my father, by the way, he didn't wait until 1970 when uh, the, the congressional hearing uh, and investigation was underway. Okay, he was actually able to move beyond the steward rating during um, the Vietnam War. Yes? What, what was uh, the relation between uh, Filipino stewards and African Americans in the uh, Well, that's interesting because in the beginning, as I mentioned, there was a, a, a Predominant um, ethnicity behind stewardship was African Americans. Um, there's a lot of racist um, statements about them serving as stewards, uh, about African Americans serving as stewards. Like they weren't clean, they were uh, too tall, their stature was too tall. No, seriously, <laughs> um, they weren't docile enough. They didn't. They weren't a tractable labor force. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Filipinos, right? And um, you know this sort of obsequious uh, nature of the Filipino, you know, that's been sort of uh, configured by Orientalist, the Orientalist imagination, right? Sort of lacking assertion and stuff like that. So they were looked on as, you know, uh, as the alternative, as an attractive, uh, attractive alternative. Um, in terms of their interaction, here's an interesting story. My father befriended this guy named Harold uh, in the ship, right? They were both stewards. Um, but my father faced a dilemma because um, a lot of those guys he, uh, on the ship were southerners. They were stationed in Panama City, Florida. Um, and um, they were anti-black but they embraced him as a friend. Okay, so um, they call, you know, they're the ones who named him Polly, the name he uses today, right? And um, he, in a sense, had to choose because Harold would invite him. Hey, why don't you go with me to my part of the town? 
You know, I'll, I'll introduce to my friends. I know these girls here over there. And, and then he, my father knew right away that once he did that, he would, he would not be accepted by his white friends. So he was in a moral dilemma there. Right? And, you know, he remembers quite poignantly everyone, when they go on liberty, you know, Harold going his own way, separate way to the town where he's accepted, and everyone else going the white part of town. And he was with them, the white part. Well, for many immigrants, one of their, they learn very quickly to find themselves white. Mm -hmm. Has the Philippine uh, immigrant community gone through that sort of that self definition? No, because I think, um, you know, this, is, this conforms to this notion of perpetual foreigner. In the case of Asians, uh, they can't readily discard this, quote, racial uniform, right? And again, this, the, the uh, Orientalist assumptions about the uh, outward appearance of Asians, physiognomies, so called, are associated with certain stereotypes. Now, this is compared to European immigrants who could, you know, even anglicize their last name. I mean, Kirk Douglas, right? We know is not really Kirk Douglas. He's from he's, my hometown. Yeah, he's a very, what is it, Ukrainian last name? He, it was, uh, <laughs> Something like that? He's Polish, I believe. He's Jewish. Okay. He was a Jewish Eastern European Jew. Okay, so, His I mean. He was a rag man, quite his rags. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, he graduated with my mother. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, that's just one example uh, of a person, especially during the 50s, when after the 1924 Immigration Act, when they halted immigration from Europe, there was no longer a tail end of immigrants coming in, and these new suburban people could actually anglicize their name and kind of lose affiliation with their past eth uh, ethnic association or affinities, right, culturally speaking. Uh, they could become white in the suburbs where no longer they confined to an ethnic neighborhood like Jewish neighborhood, uh, Irish. Now in the suburbs, their next door neighbor is Irish, and that next door neighbor is Jewish, and that next door neighbor is a Scandinavian. And you have here the sort of um, expansion of what is considered white you know, during the post-war era, associated with, you know, say, sub suburbia and all that stuff. So Filipinos and other Asians, by virtue of their racial uniform, they could not shed that. They couldn't shed the uniform. They, they could not undergo similar things like anglicizing their name, you know. Um, and, you know, just the notion that for many, uh, Asians are seen as perpetual foreigners, you know, like, uh, uh, permanently be outside the boundaries of nation, right? Um, interestingly enough, you know, uh, it's not uncommon for someone to mistakenly assume that a person of second generation, so let's say uh, French, uh, is American over a fifth generation Japanese. If you ask that person, who's American here, without talking to them, right, they would assume, they, they would assume French guy, right? And then when in fact, <laughs> you know, who, the, the Japanese guy has generations going, <coughs> scratching back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to point a lot of um, Filipinos in Hollywood, right? Actors that are um, trying to get roles. Not a lot of roles for you know playing a Filipino. So yeah. oftentimes Filipinos will play Mexicans because mm -hmm. they can like Lou Diamond Phillips. Lou Diamond Phillips and Lobamba. Most famous yeah. example, right? That a lot yeah. Of play <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think Rob <laughs> Schneider too, but he's another one. Rob Schneider's player. another one. He's yeah. half Jewish and half, but nobody knows that he's yeah. Filipino. Well, that's the thing. Um, especially, I'd say, say from the 1980s and before that, there's really this invisibility surrounding Filipino Americans in Filipino Americans in the United States. And you know, I, I, I really think there's a correlation with that. There's some kind of linkage with that and. Um, even like our colonial relation to the Philippines. Uh, because, you know, our engagement, say, the Philippine American War and colonization, it, you know, it's at um, fundamental variance, ideologically speaking, with our secular religion you know, in the United States, of freedom, democracy, so forth, you know, American creed. So here is a um, dramatic instance of where we have violated <laughs> uh, the basic precepts and protocols of our secular religion, right? So perhaps there's this historical amnesia 
surrounding this and that you could say there's some kind of link with that of invisibility of Filipinos in society too, you know. Yeah. Were there any other significant amount of non-citizen recruits that went through similar circumstances or was this situation pretty unique to Filipinos? It's pretty unique to Filipinos. Like I said, it was the colonial relation. Just as nurses, you had this pre-existing colonial institution, so too did you have this pre-existing, you know, uh, well, you know, Filipinos in, you know, the military, stuff like that. You know, they, were, they recruited some Filipinos that were in the Philippine Navy and everything. Even today, like, look at, look at government or, you know, uh, you see the effectivity of these colonial, um, I guess, institutions that were uh, put in place in the effort to uh, advance modernity to, the, to their colonial possession, right? Uh, even their government, they still they have a president, they have two chambers of Congress. You know, when you go to, my, my uh, uncle was a congressman, I got to witness some of it, they speak in English, right? Um, you know, um, even, um, you, know, um, you know, their culture is very Americanized. Um, so many aspects of the uh, Philippine culture um, has this indelible stamp of colonialism, American colonialism, colonialism in particular, but also Spanish. So. Now, by the way, there were some other uh, ethnic or national groups that were recruited uh, earlier in the naval history, like during the turn of the century from China and um, so forth. But their presence was very, very marginal compared to Filipinos. Very marginal. Yeah. Any other questions? I, yes. I kind of, a bit more of a comment. And, okay. Uh, I served in the Navy, and uh, my my company commander in boot camp was a Filipino. My chief was a Filipino. My first class was a Filipino. Yeah. And when I needed boots, I had to go to the storekeeper who was Filipino. My first class talked to the storekeeper in Tagalog. Yeah. get my boots and I started to think you know we're on a US warship yeah yet I'm surrounded by people that are not from originally yeah. born in the US yeah. and it really concerned me that if relations got bad with the Filipinos what kind of condition yeah. would, would our Navy be in yeah. and and more of a comment but what um, yeah. well you know what here's the thing in terms of relations going sour I don't see that in the foreseeable future because of that colonial connection, okay? And um, I think there's this um, um, sort of this alliance between the United States and Philippines that remains intact and seemingly indestructible, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, they were, I think they were the only Asian country that was behind uh, Bush's coalition of the willing, right? During the uh, uh, Iraq war, right? Why is that? Because, well, you know, this history of alliance between the colony and colonizer. Uh -huh. Yeah. But yeah, that's interesting too, because my dad tells me similar stories about what's happening within the Navy, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what? That kind of deal, that reminds you more of the Philippines, the sort of uh, patronage system yeah. within, uh, within. That's a Filipino thing that's being brought in there. I have to tell you, that was one of the things that disappointed <laughs> me being in the service. Yeah. The reason I served was. Because I'm an American, I want to serve my country. Sure. And I think that's why, that's my personal opinion, that's why people should join mm -hmm. the military. Okay. But that's not necessarily the reason why even Americans join the military. You know, it's, okay, it's yeah. what's in it for me. You know, can I get right. college? Can I get citizenship? The sure. Filipinos citizenship for yeah. Americans is usually trying to get college education. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, I don't know. I just think it's unfortunate that the military isn't more driven by people that want to actually just serve the military for that purpose. Yeah, but um, at the same time, they're very practical, obviously. Right. Uh, right. And, uh, yes. Your father and, and others came to realize the, you know, the, the limitations and maybe become somewhat resentful at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't stop your father from serving in Vietnam. What, how did he yeah. sort of reconcile you know, the limits of, of being a steward and, how we dislike that, and then going to Vietnam and right. fighting behalf of the Navy or the United States. Yeah. Well, first of all, you do sign a contract, okay? They're, like I said, they're contract laborers. So, um, you know, the contract period, it's either five or seven, you choose which period you want. So, 
you know, with the outbreak of hostilities by 1965, especially when it became escalated, you know, he already signed a contract. He has no choice, you know, well, to serve his. What do you personally think of it? Though, but, him, yeah, especially because they're fighting an Asian, another Asian country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is complicated. In fact, my father talked about that. He goes, "Yeah, it's kind of weird because we we're in the Philippines. And that's where we were stationed. We're going across that South China Sea, I believe, yeah, to go right. to uh, into China, and." Um, you know, interestingly enough, I uncovered in the archives, the National Archives, and uh, the U.S. government was concerned that because of the sort of uh, servant status of Asians within the Navy, that the North Vietnam would use that as part of their rhetoric, anti-American rhetoric. There was concerns about it. It was, you know, I saw it in the correspondence between, you know, but as far as Filipinos themselves, you know, um, if you look at terms of economic logic, you know, they just want to make sure they, they still get paid because they get paid. Like I said, uh, they make more than the average college educated worker in the Philippines, right? They're in the very top brackets in terms of wage earner. So, uh, you know, perhaps the indignities of servitude was worth it if they can make that money. It's your call, really. Well, I, I, to see that in the old, well, in the old building we used to have, the Asian mm -hmm. building, uh, the crew that comes in at night, uh, this man named Hoy, uh, you know, the cleaning crew, and they're employed by a community college district. Okay. He was a dentist in the Philippines, and, and okay, here yeah. he's... Perfect he's example of underemployment, yeah. Like I talked about the nurses and doctors. My, my uncle uh, is an attorney, graduated from one of the best law schools in Manila, was a high-ranking uh, government attorney, came back here, he worked as a gas station attendant. You know? Had to swallow his pride, and because yeah. you know, he can't find work here as a attorney. I was simply a Philippine Army served in Vietnam. They sent regiment or division or whatever. They actually uh, fought in Vietnam. Okay, you know, I don't know about that. I, have to look I into believe that. so. Okay. And I guess I'm old enough to remember reading the <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. accounts that uh, they were among the most, I don't know, I guess, enthusiastic mm -hmm. or... Okay, I know they served in task. Korea, but I didn't hear anything about Vietnam. Yeah, I believe the Philippines, okay. uh, Filipinos served, uh, uh, their army served mm -hmm. alongside the U.S. Army. Okay, oh, that's interesting, yeah. I was going to say, it's sort of a parallel, because my, my father was in the Air Force, and uh, he was actually um, going to be a, a spy of some sort. He was a you know, low-level spy. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was up in Monterey, you know, they have an intelligence school up there, so he's learning Morse code and Russian, which is, you know, okay. East Korea. And they right. found out one of his parents was foreign born, pulled him off with spice. Oh, school. okay. And it really pissed yeah. me off, right, because he became a philosopher. Okay. I always wanted to be a spy, I got rough, you know. I'm a big James spy Bat or philosopher. I'm a big anyway. James Bond fan, right, you know, philosophy, yeah. <laughs> I think spies a little more... Uh, <laughs> Act, I mean, you're, you're uh, moving a lot more. And, yeah. but, but, was, but that's a case where he was born here, so he wasn't. Okay, a yeah. Person, right? right. So That is interesting, yeah. yeah but it, it doesn't surprise me given the trusted. climate of the times. You weren't trusted. I mean, you yeah. had to be half trusted because they'd let you in. They didn't kick you yeah. out, obviously. Yeah. Right. But they didn't want you to go too far. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting, yeah. but not surprising. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, being attentive and uh, take care. Thanks. If you're